Well, this morning sure seems a lot different than last Sunday morning. Easter worship was great. There was lots of people here, lots of music, lots of joy and excitement. But in a lot of ways, today just seems like any other Sunday, if there is such a thing. Why is it that we want to get our lives back to normal so quickly after a holiday like Easter? Not only does that happen in the church, but the secular signs of Easter are quickly disappearing as well. The chocolate bunnies are gone. The colored eggs which were hidden have been found, we hope, and eaten. Otherwise, you'll find them in a couple of weeks. Jelly beans have been mashed into the carpet, hopefully have been removed. And even stores have been quick to go on to the next holiday down the pike. We've moved on from the contrast between the somber sanctuary on Good Friday and the beautiful setting of worship on Easter Day. It seems like in so many ways we want to try to get our lives back to normal again. Whatever normal might mean. We're so intent on locking ourselves into life in that way. And I wonder why that is. Why are we so <coughs> intent on bringing such a quick ending to such a great beginning? Do you feel like you're right back where you were before Easter this morning? Perhaps fighting familiar frustrations, carrying the same burdens, as if Easter had never occurred in the first place. I think it's really important for us to get a handle on God's words for us, especially on this Sunday after Easter. This is a message about how the risen Christ gave new life to his disciples. It's a message that some, like Thomas, struggled with. It's a message about how Jesus gave the disciples the Holy Spirit and filled them with power to do incredible acts of mercy and show incredible love in his name. But before we get to that point, I think it's important for us to understand the frame of mind that the disciples must have been in after that first Easter Sunday. We all know that the first generation Christians did not hesitate to preach the good news of the resurrection. They knew what they'd seen. They knew God had sent them to tell others what God had done in Christ. And that's what they did. You heard Peter's self-assured words as Mike read from one of his letters to the early church this morning. But the early church did not begin with that sense of exuberance, that sense of confidence. In the days following that first Easter morning, we read the disciples were scared. They were afraid. Scriptures tell us that they met behind closed doors, locked doors, because they feared the authorities. We know that Thomas didn't show up at all. One commentator that I read wrote that perhaps they were more afraid of what Jesus might be thinking of them than a fear of the authorities because of the way they had run from Jesus' side during those last days of Jesus' life on earth. Now, think about this. They would already seen that Jesus was risen. The women had told them about the empty tomb. The women had told them that they had encountered Jesus in the garden. And in the time that they'd been with Jesus, they'd certainly seen Jesus do some incredible things, some amazing things. Peter had managed to walk on water with the help of Jesus. Every one of the 12 faithful followers had been given power to heal the sick in his name as they ministered beside Jesus. They commanded demons to come out of the possessed. They'd seen thousands fed with a few loaves and fishes. They'd seen Jesus do some incredible things. They'd had some tremendous experiences. But after Good Friday, and even after Easter Sunday, they were powerless. They were fear, fear, fearless, fearful people. They couldn't make themselves do what the Lord commanded them to do, to go and preach the gospel to the whole world. They were able to say, we've seen the Lord. But after that, nothing. And Thomas wasn't even able to say that much. That's how the church of the resurrection began. And it sure didn't look like it was going to go very far. 
Something more had to happen, and Jesus knew that, and so he did something else. When he appeared to the disciples, he not only blessed them by saying, Peace be with you. He not only told them, As my Father has sent me, so I send you. He breathed on them. He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them the breath of life. He gave power to those who were powerless. This was John's account of Pentecost. <coughs> on the Sunday after Easter, more than any other Sunday, we should be able to relate to the way those first followers of Jesus felt. We know what it's like to feel powerless. We know what it's like to doubt. We know what it's like to struggle with a world that doesn't make sense to us. We know what it's like to be exhausted by that battle. We know what it's like to be caught up in a battle between right and wrong when both sides seem to have compelling arguments for convincing us of their way. And we know the pain that comes when we know the right thing to do but just can't quite seem to get it done. We know all those things. We're so much like the first disciples before the Spirit was given to them. We're fearful. We hide ourselves spiritually behind locked doors. We want to be sure that what energy we do have is preserved. What resources we do have are kept safe. The hope that we do have, as little as it is, remains intact. And as important as it is that we believe in the church and its mission, there are times when it just seems like we have no energy left. We're all worn out. We are like those disciples fighting an uphill battle with a world that seems to be at odds with the faith of compassion and love and self-sacrifice that Jesus represents. When all is said and done, we're really no different at all from those first disciples. We have absolutely nothing going for us that the world does not have going for it. In fact, we probably have less going for us in the world out there except for one thing. The risen Christ and the spirit that Jesus has given to us. And that one thing changes everything. And that's the point of today's story from John's Gospel. It's a story about how the risen Christ blew open the locked doors of a church that had absolutely nothing. He enters the discouraged sanctuary of every church and the fear-filled heart of every believer and fills them with his own life. He brought an end to that beginning. No matter what a church says about itself in the paper or on its website, if it's left on its own, depending only on its own resources and its own strength, then that church is nothing. Without the risen Christ, the church is just an empty shell. Without the spirit of Jesus Christ, we have no power. We have no message. We really have nothing to offer. We're, we're no different than any social organization or service club. And we have to bring an end to that way of thinking and start looking at our life and ministry in new ways. We can have all the programs and activities that our fertile imaginations can think of, but if we aren't empowered by the spirit of the living Christ, people will still be looking in other places to fill the void that that, that, that is found in their lives. Because... Other places can do all those things better than we can. But what they can't offer is Jesus. Friends, the answer is not in better programs or plans or promises or projects. The answer is in the person of Jesus Christ and in the gift that he brings us. Even if we're hiding behind the closed doors, the locked doors that are put there because of our fear. The basic reality of our faith is not found in what we believe, but in who we believe in, and that is where Easter begins for us. That power changed the first disciples from fearful people into men and women who were unafraid to speak to crowds of thousands. It changed them from fearful people into unafraid people who were willing to testify before those same authorities that crucified Jesus, made them willing to travel long distances and endure stoning and imprisonment and poverty. And they did not receive that power by suddenly coming to their senses and saying, well, 
I should have thought of that a long time ago. No, the beginning to that end came when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on them inside that locked room. For thousands of years, there have been men and women and children who huddle together out of fear of the unknown. They've seen their hopes and their dreams in this world turn to ashes. They believed in God, but they've been stuck in that beginning, having locked the doors of their hearts, believing that perhaps they could make it on their own. And for 2,000 years, there have also been men and women and children who have moved beyond a fearful beginning and who have experienced just what those first disciples experienced. In worship, they've looked for God, trying to understand what God is about. They've experienced Christ suddenly standing among them. And they've heard his word, peace be with you. And they've felt his breath touch them and fill them. And then they've gone out and transformed their homes and their communities and their world. The difference between those two groups is the living and the abiding presence of Jesus Christ. Great things have happened and will continue to happen in the lives of God's people, not because of us and our inner strength and our sense of purpose, but they happen because of God and God's love. They happen because we believe that Jesus Christ is alive, that Jesus Christ is with us here in worship right now, and that he's been able to burst out of that sealed tomb and enter into the locked rooms and fill the hearts of those that need him. Just like we need him right here today. I realize that the good feelings of Easter Sunday may be seven days in the past, and that the struggles of day-to-day -day life may have returned to you in full force, but the reality of Easter, the risen Christ, is still with us. Jesus asks that we trust him, that we give thanks, and that we come to this table knowing that he is alive and with us as we celebrate communion together. We can share this communion meal knowing that Jesus has risen to new life and that he is here with us to bring new life to each and every one of us and through us to the world. The beginning has ended. Jesus is here, and in spite of locked doors, he's calling us today. <laughs> in spite of locked doors and locked hearts and locked lives, we believe that Jesus Christ will give that life to us every moment of each day to come. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, you have changed things. You have amazed us, you have startled us, you have surprised us. But most importantly, you have loved us and you have set us free. We set aside doubt as we come to this table. We recall your words when you told Thomas and the disciples, Blessed are you who seen and you believe without seeing. And so we come with hearts that are open to what you would show us this day. Be with us as we come to your table. Be with us, encourage us, give us strength for the ministry that lays before us. We pray in Jesus' name.